think of the Land Rover Discovery Sport as the new Freelander of the fashion. Because although it replaces the Freelander, it represents something rather more than that, too. It's an extension of the Discovery model line, or Discovery family, as Land Rover would have you believe it, intended to represent those who want a leisure Land Rover. For the record, a Range Rover is for those who seek luxury, naturally, while the next Defender is set to provide the dual purpose of extreme off-road capability plus more habitability than it currently offers. Leisure, then, means the ethos of the Freelander's replacement has changed a little. It's a more spacious vehicle than before, to the extent that two chairs in the boot will make it a seven-seater, albeit a compact one. With that comes a higher price. At the moment, the range starts at more than 31,000 pounds. The 2.2-liter diesel engine offered at launch has been replaced by a smaller capacity turbocharged 2.0-liter engineering engine. Buyers can opt for the 148 bhp version which is only available with a 6-speed manual or choose the 177 bhp unit available with Land Rover's 9-speed automatic. There is even talk of a hotter desk this for on the agenda to complete the range. Then, of course, there's the choice of trim level. The 31,095 pounds entry point is an LSE manual, before moving to less tech and HSE trim levels and topping out at the HSE Dynamic Lux priced at a gulp sum 46,510 pounds when equipped with the optional 9-speed automatic gearbox. That's a far cry from the £7.20 k 3 day convertible Freelander that funked its way onto the market in 1997, accompanied by a more sensible five-door wagon. Sensible won over again when it came to the five-door only second-generation Freelander in 2006. Another generation where practicality overrides other factors brings us the seven-seat discovery for today. Already we have compared it against the BMW X3, Hyundai Santa Fe, and the Volvo X360, and the new entrant to this market, the Mercedes Benz GLC, and Trim twice. So let's see how it gets on under auto cost scrutiny, design, and styling. When you learn that the new Discovery Sport will be built alongside the Range Rover back at Land Rover's Hollywood plant on Merseyside, it would be easy to assume that the two share the same platform. However, that's only half of the truth. Although the two are largely the same at the front, the Discovery Sport is all new from the B-pillar's back. This is eminently sensible. The major crash structure and most complex mechanicals of a modern car sit between the axle line and the eight pillars. Making changes to those areas costs lots of time and even more money. So the subframe, with a magnesium cross member and other components, is largely the same around the front. Although, unlike the Airbox, the Discovery Sport has a pedestrian airbag in its nose. Aft of the B-pillars, however, the Discovery Sport has a new structure that leaves it 80 millimeters longer than the Evoque, all of which comes from within the wheelbase. The changes include a new multi-link rear suspension system that has only minimal intrusion into the passenger and luggage compartment, enabling the fitment of those plus two rear chairs. JLR's 500 million pound investment in its new engine plant in Wolverhampton has rid it of its reliance on other people's power plants, which has seen the 2.2-liter or derived turbots will become a thing of the past and replaced by the smaller capacity Ingenium units. The model tested here is badged as the SD4, it's offered in 188 bhp form, which it generates at 3,500 revolutions per minute, with a torque output of 310 pounds foot at 1,750 revolutions per minute. Regardless of whether you buy Disco Sport with an SD4 or TD4 engine, that's enough says the Land Rover, to tow 2,200 kilograms, or 2,500 kilograms if you delete the plus two rear seats. That's quite a lot more than the claimed pro grade of 1,863 kilograms, which might alarm some towers, so it's worth noting that this test car six are scaled at a substantial 2,081 kilograms. That portliness will affect the fuel consumption, as will the Discovery Sports hardware. This is, after all, a Land Rover, so it isn't made out of the factory unless it will do things off-road that its rivals simply can't. To that end, the Sport receives Land Rover's terrain response control, although because this is a coil and not air from Land Rover, there's a limit to what it can just in its performance largely centers around speaking of the electronic stability program. 
but the Discovery Sport also has a full-time four-wheel drive system with a hull deck, printer coupling, and is electronically controlled so it can push power forward or off as it pleases. The Sport is also expected to wade through 600 milliliters of water and have cross-leading approach, departure, and breakover angles. Whether it can combine all those with fine and low dynamics is what we are about to see. Continue to interior. The channel Land Rover has had to negotiate with the Sports Kevin is a narrow one. A premium look and feel are vital if the model is to compete with upmarket offerings from BMW and Audi, yet it cannot be permitted to trample on the toes of the Evoque, which remains above it in the range setting order. Thus, the debonair sense of style you give in the Evoque is restrained here. This is plainly a more work at effort. The chunky handsomeness, best expressed in the bold, straight lines and clearly labeled switch gear, owes much to the outgoing Freelander's aesthetic, although the crisp face of dashboard is pure of art. The driving position, happily, is nearly archetypal Land Rover, meaning somewhere between crow's nest and comfy lounge chair. A Range Rover customer would spot the bottom line compromises made by the manufacturer when it picked out trim materials. Evident even in our high spec test car, but a good dealer will encourage you to swivel around and regard the sport's sexual feats as a proper point of differentiation. There are six trim levels to spec the Land Rover Discovery Sport out in. The entry level SE trim comes with car leather trim, climate and cruise control, heated front seat, Bluetooth, rear parking sensors, and JLR's latest 8.0 in color touch screen with DAB radio, all are standard. Mid-level SE tech adds fat mass, automatic lights and wipers, front parking sensors and a useful power tailgate. Opt for the HSE level and expect such luxuries as keyless entry, a panoramic sunroof, rear view camera and a 380-watt Meridian sound system, while the HSE black trim adds black exterior trim and 20-in alloy wheels. In HSE luxury trim, the Discovery Sport further gains full leather interior, heated and cooled seats heated steering wheel, USB ports and a self-parking mode, meanwhile the range topping HSE Dynamic Lux adds sporty details and trim. The packaging sleight of hand is impressive, you really wouldn't think there's room, despite the 2741mm wheelbase, although its cons are obvious enough. With hardly anywhere for the second tier to go, a potentially shin bruising clamber is required to reach the third row, making the two rearmost seats virtually adult proof from the start. Nevertheless, the individual pews, modestly raised from the boot floor, are proper little perches rather than mere hollows, and with the sacrifice of the sun leg room for the passenger in front, there's clearly enough room for fledgling legs. As the plus two designation suggests, the arrangement is about short haul capacity only. This is not a seven-seat family car in the conventional mold. Certainly, there isn't much load space left once the third row is up. That doesn't significantly detract from the usefulness of the system, though. Much like the sport's ability to climb a mountain, you wouldn't expect to use it every day, but it's nice to know if there should be need. Continue to performance. There is only two engine options on the Discovery Sport, both use the same 2.0-liter turbocharged four-cylinder diesel unit, producing two outputs. 148 bhp and 177 bhp. However, our test car used Ford derived 2.2 liter diesel and the sport's most noticeable connection to the past is unmistakably that engine, which currently shadows everything the car does with the clatter and gun smoke coder of yesteryear. Denying the car the new four-cylinder engine and oil burner from launch was clearly the model's on paper Achilles steel and, to a greater or lesser extent, that's the way it plays out on the road. However, although the direct injected 2.2-liter motor is not a paragon of refinement or efficiency, its later life development has at least ensured that it produces the unmistakable surge expected of a modern lower equipped diesel. On stream, its 310 pounds foot of torque is a plentiful amount, and it feels that way. For a car that tip the scales on the wrong side of two times when we rate it, a sub 9.0 seconds, 0 to 60 miles per hour time is very decent. So is the 9.0 seconds it takes to get from 30 miles per hour to 70 miles per hour, very slightly bettering the time we recorded for the much admired 2.2-liter engine in the Mazda CX-5 a couple of years ago. In fact, the soft underbelly of the package is times evident less in the 20th century motor and more in the 21st century gearbox to which it has been shackled. 
rather inevitably, the nine speed automatic transmissions keen to keep the engine sitting at its productive and change pitch means that you're going to have to live with a lot of downshifting, particularly on the motorway, where the never ending 47.5 miles per hour per 1000 revolutions per minute final ratio cannot be trusted with even modest acceleration. However, it's the intermittent hesitancy experienced at fast getaways that tends to chase. It's not quite clear whether this is a function of the gearbox's default to seconds, keeping an ultra low first ratio chiefly for off road duties, or the initial reluctance to lock up that we've sometimes encountered in other ZF equipment and drovers. But the half second of drive lined amusement is infuriating when you're trying to make a gap in the traffic. Nevertheless, the 9 speeders otherwise swift function. It will block change rather than cycle sequentially, and the inclination to shift are what make the automatic sport significantly faster than the 6 speed manual, and keeping the fire stoked is an attitude that suits the car just fine. Right and handling. Of the many potential hurdles to fall at here, the first does not trouble the new Discovery Sport. Emphatically, this still feels like a modern Land Rover, and in a segment now oversubscribed with top hatted saloon cars, the appeal of that single fact cannot be understated. The Evox success has given the manufacturer a license to repeat much of the formula. Even with its bigger skin, this is a purposeful device, not so much rugged as street tough, but simultaneously lean and big shouldered enough to justify its visual presence. For those switching from the smallest range rover, it's worth mentioning that the edges are more apparent here, especially in the quality of the secondary ride, which occasionally stumbles from crisply rugged to downright bony, a vice not helped by the sport's wider failure to isolate you from the audible machinations of the suspension. This chivying at the comfort levels does the car a disservice if for no other reason than that the primary ride, its capacity to soak up the low frequency hills of UK road that accrues, is generally stellar. Again, this is the manufacturer's unparalleled understanding of how a contemporary Land Rover must be made to handle, not, crucially, as a sports saloon might, but rather how something tall, forceful and hefty ought to. The contrivance at work among its rivals is acid, replaced by the apparently organic fluency of an SUV not disguising its amplified body movements but instead turning them to an inner rear pleasing model of consistency and linear balance. Apart from an occasionally awkward wig at maneuvering speed, the same finesse has been applied to the steering, which allows this mass to be threaded along with a kind of linear delicacy that is rarely accorded to hatchbacks, let alone SUVs. Consequently, on the open road, the car can be driven swiftly and very pleasingly. Its occasional harshness and questionable refinement notwithstanding, it is the charm of this two-way relationship that defines the sport as good to drive beyond all else, and wonderfully typical of Land Rover's current output. Continue to MPG and running car. Introduction design and styling interior performance ride and handling MPG and running cost verdict prices and specs. At present, the Discovery Sport starts at about £10,000 less than our top spec test car, and that's a good thing. Truth be old, at £45,000, more than the starting price of a full-size Discovery, the car doesn't feel like especially good value, not because it isn't very well kitted out, it is, but because the smaller yet more stylish Chevrolet and the much quicker BMW X3 S Drive 30D are both available for less. The fact that the BMW, despite being 68 BHP superior in output and two cylinders to the fit in size, also trumps the sport and quoted economy and emissions highlights just how badly this new model meets its engineering engine. Later, a more frugal two-wheel drive model will pop up the range. And now, though, buyers will have to make nearly 44.8 miles per gallon combined, clean to just 33.9 miles per gallon when we subject it to true MPG analysis and 166 grams slash km of CO2, a full 49 grams slash km more than the two-wheel drive Volvo XC60 D4, which is the class leader on running costs. However, the Sport has excellent resale values and trumps the BMW X3 and XC60 in this area, being able to hold its retained values stronger over a three-year period. Nevertheless, in SE Auto spec, the Sport is decently equipped and generally well-priced compared with its mostly German rival, even if some of the things you really want, sat nav, a powered tailgate, front fog lights, are the preserve of the aptly named SC Tech trim and above. We devoid the manual gearbox and the top spec HSE luxury trims level.
Our pick would be the 9-speed automatic transmission with the mid-level SE tech trim and all the optional USB sockets. Verdict. Focus on the sport's shortcomings and it's conceivable that half a star could justifiably be trimmed from its score. Although fielding a new model with a very short expiry date stamped on the engine bay isn't entirely unheard of, it remains cruel and unusual. The car also doesn't entirely convince on refinement or relative comfort. The Ingenium engines are a vast improvement, although they lack the outright performance of their German equivalents and sound gruff on startup, there is enough low down grunt to compensate. However, the Discovery Sport appear to have the makings of an instant hit as a show concept, and prolonged exposure to the real thing does little to dial back that impression. The rich theme of desirability that Land Rover has with the Evoc is readily apparent, not just in how it looks but also how it drives. It's another convincing Land Rover with lots of handle and finesse, style and capability. That the experience is now underpinned by a car better proportioned to meet the needs of a family will prove a clincher for many buyers. Prudence may cause some to pause for the Ingenium engines in mind, but Land Rover has built a car worth waiting for.